It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us back on the show is our good friend Rick Becker, here to talk about Scripture, specifically Sola, which Scripture? I like this. Thanks for being here, Rick. Of course. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Sola, which Scriptura of asterisks, additions, and other ancient authorities? Such good alliteration. <laughs> I don't know about my writing, but I, I pride myself on my clever titles. <laughs> that is three quarters of the battle right there. That's right. That's so right. When you were Protestant, how often were you reading the Bible? Oh, daily. I mean, God willing. I mean, I'd like to think that I was reading it daily. I was doing quiet times. And, and of course, you know, it, it's so funny when, when you ask that question, and I don't blame you, but the implicit assumption is that Catholic Christians wouldn't be reading the Bible daily, which and it could be true, but if we're trying to get to liturgy on a regular basis, we're being bathed in Scripture constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we say our rosary, we're, those are all Bible prayers and uh, based on Scripture, based on New Testament passages. And any time we do any type of devotion, or certainly when we're at Mass, we're, we're constantly being bathed in Scripture, even if we're not taking out our Bible and reading it, which, of course, Hopefully we will. But in any case, yes, yeah, certainly as a, when I was uh, before I became a Catholic, growing up in, in the evangelical tradition, I was trying to read my Bible every day, and um, because it was our one source of authority, based on that idea from the Reformation of sola scriptura, the Latin phrase meaning scripture alone and sola fide, uh, faith alone. But we didn't have a magisterium. We didn't uh, have any sort of confidence in sacred tradition, which we do as Catholics. So the Bible was it. And I spent as much time as, as I could memorizing verses, memorizing whole swaths of Scripture and getting to know it well. And as I say in the piece at the register, um, as I got older and started reading the footnotes, uh, I started finding some troubling oddities, uh, which was that there were certain, that book, that solid uh, text, that codex that I held my hands and flipped the pages through, I would thought of as being the Bible. But as the footnotes revealed, the Bible had some flux to it. There were certain passages that, and the phrase in the Revised Standard Version that I use when I was growing up, the phrase was always, other ancient authorities add, or other ancient authorities do not include, or it was always other ancient authorities that um, <laughs> that apparently <laughs> were leading the reader to alternative versions of the text. So that text that I held in my hand that I thought was the Word of God, apparently based on those footnotes, wasn't as solid, wasn't as final, wasn't as concrete as I, I guess I was uh, hoping it would be. And that led me to ask additional questions, which played a role in my... Uh, in my conversion. Yeah. Can I guess back up a little bit and sure. explain the concept of Sola Scriptura for those that uh, maybe have heard it thrown around a little bit, but they're not really sure what it means or where it comes from. Sure. Um, my understanding uh, based on my background and as an evangelical Protestant growing up and, and my time of studying theology, formerly the Wesleyan tradition, but in general, the idea of sola scriptura, it, it relying on the Bible alone as our primary authority for um, faith and morals. Uh, like in the Catholic faith, we rely on that three-part. I, I think I always uh, envision a, a stool with three legs. We've got scripture and tradition, which are the two streams of one uh, revelation. And then that third leg of the stool is the magisterium, which helps us interpret in any given age, uh, scripture and tradition. And in my Protestant upbringing uh, as a Presbyterian, and then later in the Wesleyan tradition, um, there was this general idea that tradition, though we can uh, pay attention to tradition, and we can pay attention to the teaching of our church leaders, that everything, the, the only rule, the only final arbiter of any question was scripture. And of course, one of the problems with that, as many have pointed out, and as I pointed out elsewhere in, in other writings that I've done, is that who gets to decide then? Who gets to decide how to interpret? If uh-huh. there's no no magisterial authority, if there's no tradition 
to um, interpret scripture uh, and then vice versa. But if there's no final authority, if there's no magisterial authority, then who gets to decide? And, and in the end, what that means for many Protestant traditions is that every individual Christian becomes his own pope. Mm-hmm. That's why, I'm, and that's for, frankly, that's one that's one of the ways that uh, converts will talk about their conversions. That um, I came to the place where I decided there was either going to be one pope or everybody gets to be pope, uh-huh. um, as a shorthand for you know our understanding of, of magisterium. So yeah, so scripture then becomes the sole rule for everything that we believe as Protestant Christians. And obviously there's different takes on that in the different traditions. Um, I've already mentioned a couple, the Reformed and Calvinist tradition, the Wesleyan tradition, the Anabaptist tradition. Every every Protestant tradition and church has its own understanding of how sola scripture, uh, scripture works out. But that's, the, that's one of the main differences between um, our separated brethren, our Protestant brethren, and, uh, and Catholics. Well, and since that isn't a teaching of the Bible itself, then who has the authority to say that the only authority is the Bible, I guess? be <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> and that, that would be another uh, reason for confusion and, and, uh, and doubt as, as to that teaching. But what I tried to talk about in this article was a third one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Which I had never all, heard you know, about the, this. This asterisk in John five four, uh, yes, uh, that yes, uh, the, the John five four asterisk uh, <laughs> has to do with a part of uh, well, John five four itself is missing uh, uh-huh. from most of our modern translations because it was from one of those alternative readings, and you'll find it in let's see. Uh, John 5 talks about Jesus encountering the crippled man at the um, pond in um, the pool of Bethesda. Is that what it is? I think it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the tradition was that whoever is laying at this pool and, and the, the waters are stirred up, uh, that if he gets down to the pool first, while the waters, waters are stirred up, that he would be cured. And John 5 Four is a interpolation, uh, apparently, of someone at some point that explained that tradition. So apparently, the original version of John's Gospel did not include uh, John four, part of the, the end of John three and, and the beginning of John four, that talks about how. And I'll just quote it here from the Revised Standard Version: that at certain seasons. An angel of the Lord went down into the pool and troubled the water, and whoever stepped in first after troubling the water was healed. So that ex- explanation of this, of why that uh, crippled man was waiting, hanging out at this pool all the time, was based on the textual evidence, um, was not in the original gospel. And depending on what version, English version, uh, English translation of the Bible that you read, 5.4 may be in the footnotes or may be up in the text. So the question then is, well, who gets to decide? Who gets to decide what is part of sacred scripture and what is thrown down into the footnotes? Right. And um, and as I talk about in the article, that it, you know the Vulgate, uh, the, the the Latin version of uh, Latin translation of the Greek and Hebrew scriptures that uh, Saint Jerome did back in the fourth century uh, plays a role in all this. But ultimately, it is the Church herself. It's the Church herself who decides what the scriptures are and what is sacred scripture and what what isn't. As I say in the article, maybe this little aside in John 5, 4 doesn't seem all that important, but there are larger chunks of scripture that have somewhat uh, kind of um, bumpy uh, uh, provenance in terms of whether or not they were part of the original documents, but have found their way into our Bible and are counted as sacred scripture. And the questions, again, is what, like the end of Mark 16, a uh, big, big uh, part of the Gospel of Mark, some Bible scholars completely dismiss as being a, a, a later insertion. But the Church has always accepted Mark 16 as being sacred scripture. And that's the point of the article, is that the Bible does stand as a sort of in judgment of the Church. You know, the Bible is the rule for the Church, but the Church, in a sense, is also a rule for you know what we understand to be uh, sacred scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the church that gave us the scripture, and in a sense, the scripture helped form the church. It's a conversation uh, that takes place throughout the centuries constantly from the beginning. Uh, 
and that we get to participate in now, not only because of the magisterium, but by our own taking up of the scriptures and interacting with the scriptures and, and living them out. So I don't know if I helped or, or, or hurt the, our conversation by that <laughs> explanation, but it is, um, you know, if people could take out their Bibles and they look up John 5, they'll see that their modern translations that 5.4 is in the footnotes. And that's, that's what uh, all of the uh, article is about. Yeah, which I think you mentioned several things here. One is that after we read scripture to have help interpreting what we read is important, but also exactly. the realization that what we're actually reading to itself, somebody made a decision on how to interpret that before we even read it and even what to include and not to include. Uh, but going beyond this, I think one thing it reminds me is the importance of reading the footnotes in general, that there's so much context and additional information that is available in those footnotes that I think a lot of times we just skip over when we're just reading verses or stories out of the Bible or hearing them at mass and not getting those footnotes and getting that additional information. So encouraging people to check that out as well. Yes. And I know that there are people out uh, there that can be listeners that are probably aware of, uh, I mean, when, when we're talking about the footnotes and we're talking about scholarship, we're talking about opinion, right? Mm-hmm. Because the footnotes aren't necessarily going to represent magisterial teaching. They're going to represent the opinions and the insights of scholars, and that can change from time to time. And depending on what Bible we use and what study texts that we rely on, uh, we're going to find disagreement. But even that disagreement is part of the ongoing conversation that we have in the Church with the Scripture and with sacred tradition, and uh, you know, always under the, the guidance of the magisterium. I, I, I want to jump back for a second just to this idea of the complicated, and I use the word messy in the article, the messy way in which uh, the scriptures came together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and which, if for me as a Protestant who was com- becoming a Catholic, it was so freeing to find out how the church understood the relationship between the church and scripture. And I, I just want to refer to a um, Vatican II document called Dei Verbum, the, the Constitution on uh, Divine Revelation, which in my New American Bible, my Bible is actually included in the very front. And I would suggest to your listeners that to take out their Bible, because chances are that this document from Vatican II is in their Bible, and they can certainly find it online too. But in paragraph eight, it says, the words of the Holy Father's witness to the presence of the living tradition whose wealth is poured into the practice and life of the believing and praying church. Through that same tradition, the church's full canon of sacred books is known, and the sacred writings themselves are more profoundly understood and unceasingly made active in her. So again, it's this idea of tradition helping us understand what constitutes sacred scripture, and then sacred scripture then influencing the development of tradition and our understanding of the church and how we live out those uh, the truth that uh, God wanted committed to the scriptures that we hold to be God's word. And um, I use the word in my article, I talk about it being like a dance. When I was uh, growing up in the Protestant church, it seemed very linear. You know, you read the Bible and you do what the Bible says and compare everything to the Bible. And it was almost like um, an academic exercise. But the fact is that if we're talking about this relationship or this conversation going forward between scripture and tradition and magisterium and the lived life experience of those in the church living with the body of Christ, that it's much more like, much more like a dance, uh, which is, I guess, more consistent with how we experience the faith itself, right? It's never very linear. It tends to be, it has a more aesthetic quality to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's uh, a beauty to it in its unfolding, I guess, and that when we approach the scriptures, we shouldn't be looking for answers like we're going to a a textbook or a math book. What we're looking for is uh, an encounter. And I can't think of a better example of this, and maybe I've talked about this before before. Kyle with you, but um, my favorite picture of this is from C.S. Lewis in um, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. If you think back the very beginning of Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the children that are going to be swept up into the adventure um, of the rest of the book are looking at a painting, very static. It's a painting on the wall. And suddenly the painting begins to 
develop a three-dimensional character. And what looks like movement in the waves actually becomes movement in the painting. And it's within that context of this, what ought to be a static, you know, uh, two-dimensional um, picture uh, becomes a three-dimensional uh, living kind of experience. And that to me, and I think, I, I, I can't help but think that C.S. Lewis had in mind this idea of encountering Scripture, not as a two-dimensional, you know, linear um, experience, but something three-dimensional and living, um, and being swept up into Scripture rather than just sort of reading it as, as a, you know, as a straight prose, that it's, it's an encounter. And then, of course, the, the, the primary encounter when we approach Scripture is with Christ, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. Hmm. When, we, when we read Scripture, we encounter Christ. And that should change us, right? It's not just learning something. It's not just learning datum, uh, uh, data or, or ideas or principles. It's yeah. about being knocked down <laughs> by an encounter with the living God. Yeah. All right. Well, people can check out your article from the National Catholic Register, ncregister.com. Sola Witch Scriptura is what it's called. So people can check that out. Also, check out your blog at God Haunted Lunatic if you do a Google search for that. So thank you so much, Rick Becker, for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>